Hi there, um, my name is Pierre Andrews and this is my presentation for SRA 22. I wanted to present to you today a uh, framework that I've built and I know that everyone's going to groan and say yes, another framework, but what I have noticed is that there is um, a lot of talk and discussion and frameworks around ethical use of AI and in particular um, automated decision-making systems as well. But the special context of the use of these kinds of systems in government is largely missing. Um, a lot of the um, frameworks tend to focus on uh, human oversight and, and human interventions, um, human review. Uh, and I believe that whilst they are necessary, I do not think that they're sufficient, particularly for the special context of government. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is present a little bit about um, the, the special context of uh, government, in particular the public sector, um, why I think that some of the current uh, um, approaches are insufficient, and um, some suggestions about uh, what might um, make it uh, sufficient. So, the start is uh, for a bit of background, um, how uh, governments all around the world have been um, rapidly uh, adopting technology, obviously, over the last 30 years or so. And, um, and in the process of doing so, have uh, done a lot of system automation, of process automation, of um, shifting you know, from paper to digital. Uh, unfortunately, how this has been done has often led to uh, inscrutable, opaque systems that may or may not have any line of sight to their uh, legal authority, to the um, uh, rationale behind uh, how an output from that system is made. Um, this creates some significant issues around uh, public trust of government. So when you have uh, citizens and residents continuously and increasingly faced with a computer says no situation from public services, from policies, from um, applying for something, this creates a, um, and, and combined with an unclear or difficult to access avenue for getting an explanation or repealing, that creates a certain disenfranchisement of the public. Uh, it disempowers people, it um, leaves people even more vulnerable uh, at a point where uh, if they're engaging with government, it's often because they need help um, and something has gone wrong in their life. Uh, it creates a more disconnected services. Um, it creates um, an issue of uh, a lot of AI-based ADM systems are machine learning based. Uh, and when you use historical data to train and response, uh, it creates both a perpetuation of potentially biased or historical approaches to a, a system or a service. Um, and it also creates uncertainty because um, you'll get a different output um, over time um, and it's not necessarily going to be consistently applied rules uh, because of the um, machine learning part of these these types of systems. So you get, um, when you get inconsistency in the application of law or rules in government, that creates a lot of obvious uh, um, issues for consistency in society and fairness and, and equity. Um, you also get a low traceability to authoritative rules. Uh, a lot of uh, systems, not just government systems, a lot of software um, takes rules, you know, whether they're from legislation or regulation or operational policy or even just system constraints of a particular piece of software, and it all kinds of gets mashed up. And when you get the output of a system like that, uh, it's not necessarily easy to see which law or legal authority that um, decision was or action was made upon. Um, and it's uh, usually, in my experience, very hard to tease apart which law, which rules are authoritative because the rule that comes from legislation or regulation should trump a rule that's coming out of operational policy or uh, internal ways of working in that department or that organisation. And yet when they're both just part of the same spaghetti mess, it's very difficult uh, to unpack those things. And I think uh, the final issue around uh, the massive um, um, uh, techno, you know, um, change in government is shifting um, incentive systems. When people are applying rules they tend to do it through their own uh, value system. And so you tend to have a inherent and natural incentive of um, doing the right thing by the person in front of you. Uh, when you have machines making decisions, uh, unless you have 
purposely programmed in human values and uh, human quality of life metrics as the uh, as the goal and, and success criteria for that system, then they tend to work with what they have. Um, a lot of systems naturally um, prioritise money or efficiency or, or consistency potentially, um, but you're not necessarily getting um, uh, the human outcomes, um, the best um, incentives towards human outcomes. So there's a few challenges there with, uh, I guess, the, the, the way uh, the system is uh, as we currently have it. Um, the approach of just applying an ethics framework across the top can, of course, lead to um, um, situations where the people deciding ethics and not the people being affected. Um, of course, I think everyone uh, acknowledges that it's very difficult to get uh, adequate training and education and sufficient resources to take a, um, a properly uh, human-centric approach to, uh, to review and to oversight. Um, there is no minimum requirements that are prescriptive, measurable or standards-based. Uh, so the resulting ethical systems are likely to be inconsistent with each other, not measurable against any meaningful human impact criteria. And I guess the question that I would like to pose to you all is, how can you avoid harm if you're not measuring for harm? Um, if we don't understand the, the full human impact of the systems that we build, then how can we ensure that the human impact is a net positive uh, for individuals, for society, for families, um, et cetera? So um, I put together a bit of a complementary framework, a, a framework that is meant to um, sit alongside and complement human review frameworks, uh, of which I won't talk about today. Um, and just before I jump into the framework, I'll talk about the special context of government, because I think this is often forgotten. A lot of people think of government as just another organisation, you know, no different from any other sector. And uh, I've even had people say to me, oh, no, government, government's the same as any other sector because, you know, uh, even in accountability, a company needs to be accountable to the shareholders, so what's different? Let me give you a couple of reasons why government is different. Um, first of all, it needs to comply to um, whatever the local equivalent is of administrative law. So in Australia, we have a thing called administrative law. A lot of governments have a similar sort of thing. The basic premise of administrative law is that the um, every action or decision needs to be um, um, within the legal authority and remit of that person, of that organisation, of that delegation, um, and which means that you need to be able to explain what uh, delegation you're working under. You need to be able to audit. Uh, you need to have uh, access to justice. Uh, so individuals affected by that decision or action need to be able to appeal it, which means you need to actually record it and be able to monitor it and be able to go back to it at some point. This access to justice part is, is fairly important, um, as is um, uh, privacy pr preservation. Uh, you need to um, be compliant with Privacy Act and with principles around privacy and protections of, um, of the citizens, of the residents, of the jurisdiction for which you're working. Um, we have a... a um, uh, obligation in government to uh, to actually try to pursue a public good, which means I'm um, ensuring that uh, there are good human outcomes, uh, societal outcomes, economic outcomes, environmental out outcomes. So there's a reasonable pressure of that, uh, which also means um, being very clear about and upholding human and moral rights. Now, in every jurisdiction, that is different. In Australia, we don't have technically a um, Bill of Rights, but there are still a whole bunch of rights that have been um, um, captured in law and, and built up over over time that um, the public service needs to be um, compliant with. Now, that might be a bit more generic, but back to more specifics, the constitutional and legal um, and legislative purpose of a department, of a, of a jurisdiction, is captured in the Constitution, in legislation, so that is definitely context to take into account. Um, the final two are quite quite uh, significant, the democratic context. Um, the role of the public sector is to serve the government of the day, the parliament and the people. And there is a definite democratic context even beyond the actions and activities of the, um, of the public sector. There is also the fact that uh, people will only trust, um, uh, people's trust in the public sector has a direct impact on their trust on democracy because if people start to distrust the public sector, they start to distrust everything that the public sector sector administers, which is also inclusive of our electoral processes. 
And the final and post possibly most serious um, piece of context, again, which a lot of people forget, um, is that governments, um, public sectors, have the state monopoly on violence. This is basic political theory 101. It's not very complicated. Um, and, uh, and it basically goes like this. Um, when you hear people complain that, uh, well, if, if the public are happy to share their data with Facebook or Google, why aren't they happy to share it with government? The reason's quite simple. Um, only governments have the power um, to apply um, violence. To, uh, to lock you up, to take your children, to, um, to incur a uh, fine, uh, to take uh, money. These are all um, very scary and very difficult things, um, which is why the public sector needs to operate within a tight constraint, within tight controls, within tight governance. Um, uh, this context is extremely important because if governance systems are not fair, equitable, lawful, appealable, et cetera, then the real impact on people's lives can be and has been devastating. And we've seen many examples of that over the years and the paper goes into a couple more. So what could we do? What could a trustworthy framework look like? Um, I have in this paper, um, after looking at lots of different definitions, defined trustworthy as basically having three characteristics. Um, trust um, is uh, A, a willingness to believe that a person or entity is operating in good faith. B, with integrity, and C, in a way that fulfills the individual's expectations of that person and entity or entity. So this paper attempts to create, to demonstrate how AI and ADM and other potentially systems could be considered trustworthy through demonstrating good faith, through systemic and measurable commitment to human-centred and humane outcomes, high integrity, so systems that are lawful, accurate, consistently applied and appealable and monitorable and measurable, and C, that meets public expectations. Um, government systems should reflect public values, public needs, should do no harm, should be transparent and operate within the relevant legal, social, moral and jurisdictional limitations of power uh, with good oversight and governance um, over the top of that. So uh, I've posed uh, six questions in this paper um, of how to create systems that could be considered trustworthy. And why do I talk about trustworthy systems in the paper? Well, I don't believe trust is something that you should ask for. Trust is something you should earn. So rather than continuously asking for or seeking trust, I think that uh, the best way that uh, the public sector can build public trust is to act in a trustworthy way, to design systems that are designed to be trustworthy from the front. So the six questions in the paper ask, how would you audit and monitor the decisions and actions taken, their accuracy and their legal authority in real time? That becomes a, a good question to pose at the heart of the design of any system policy uh, or service. Secondly, how would an end user, a citizen, a resident, etc., know, understand, challenge, and then appeal a decision or action? How would they? What does that user journey look like? Um, and how is it simple and easy to find? Three, how would you know whether the action or decision or process is having a fair, positive or negative impact? How would you know the impact? Four, how would you ensure and maintain independent oversight and effective governance? I have seen people in government say, um, we've got a bunch of systems that aren't working quite right, quite right, so let's fix them, but we already have governance in place, so let's just keep using it when it begs the question, if your existing governance is working, then how did you end up with problems in the system? So actually making sure that you have independence in that is key. Five, how would you detect, respond to, and implement continuous change? If you don't have a system which is able to respond to and assume continuous change, whether the change is coming from internally or from policy change or from changing um, circumstances in the community, then you have a system that um, might be perfect day one, but very rapidly becomes a, a problem day two. So building systems that have uh, operating models around them to support continuous change is critical. And finally, how would you operate in a way the public would consider trustworthy? This goes to values-based and um, public values management. Um, and it goes to the idea that each department, each jurisdiction is going to have a different type of relationship based on their function, based on their purpose. Um, what the public might expect from an environmental agency might be quite different to what they expect from a social service agency, 
or from an intelligence agency. So taking that context into account, not just at a jurisdictional level, but at a departmental level, and engaging with the public on what it would take for them to trust you is a very effective way of building trustworthy systems, governance, and models. So each government system demands a solid answer for each of these. Uh, the paper goes into a whole bunch of strategies and recommendations around explainability, around traceability, monitoring, um, operational responsiveness, and much more. Um, I really hope that you can take the moment to have a quick read um, and uh, let me know what you think. And there are recommendations in the paper, um, uh, particularly for the Australian context that draws from experience from all around the world. Um, and um, things like in New Zealand, there is actually a piece of legislation that says that every department has a legal obligation to provide explainability to people uh, who ask about decisions made about them. Uh, it's called Section 23 of the OIA uh, and well worth having a, a quick look at. There's a lot of recommendations that draw from international best practice and try to um, help um, uh, draw out more of a conversation about what it would take to build trustworthy AI and ADM systems in the special context of government. I hope you've enjoyed uh, this brief uh, chat about the paper and uh, I look forward to, um, to the conversation at the conference. Thank you.